So let's look first at some patristic sources. So these are going to be sources um, in the early centuries of the Christian story um, who, who are to some degree closer to the apostles. Um, they're not necessarily directly in line from the apostles, but they're closer in time to the apostles. And in many streams of, of Christian theology, uh, patristic sources are thought to be very important, um, partly because of their proximity to the apostles, partly because uh, they were, many of them were influential in the shaping of early basic orthodoxy, that is, the early um, basic confessions about God as Trinity and about Jesus as fully human and fully divine, um, and because they were important social and political figures in shaping the life of the church in response to their own context. So we're going to look at a number of these figures. The first one we will look at is uh, uh, Justin Martyr. And Justin Martyr is known particularly as an early apologist. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about apologetics or an ap apologist, sometimes we might have in mind certain kinds of argumentation, which might be done as apologetics. And, of course, there are various ways of doing that and various kinds of arg argumentation. But in the broadest sense, what we mean is giving a public witness to the faith. So, uh, you know, giving an apology or being an apologist ought to be really coming from a framework, uh, from a from a uh, specifically theological framework, and bearing a public witness in some intelligible way to that faith. And that's what Justin tried to do. And, and Justin is operating in a circumstance uh, when the church is uh, in the minority, and he's having to respond to claims by, by um, pagan sources that Christianity really is an atheistic religion. Now, that sounds kind of bizarre to us today, uh, because, you know, if you're engaged in anything that would seem like apologetics, a lot of times what you're doing is responding to modern atheists and trying to demonstrate that there's, you know, some reasonableness in believing in a god. Well, certainly the pagans believed in gods, but what they argued was that the Christians uh, didn't believe in the pagan gods, which of course they didn't, and that therefore the Christians were atheists. And they had all sorts of bizarre charges against the Christians, things like um, Christians eat babies, and they, you know, they, they misinterpreted the Eucharist um, as you know, eating the literal blood and, and, and uh, body of a human being and of a baby and so on. So all sorts of things like that. But on the philosophical side, what Justin is trying to do is to show that Christian thought, um, Christian ways of living, are actually consistent with concepts of Greek concepts of reason. And that, in fact, they're more consistent with Greek, Greek concepts of reason than the pagan ways of living. And that, indeed, the... Christian ways of living in the long run are better for society, better for the empire than the pagan ways of living. Um, so one of the themes that I just want to mention that the book talks about is this idea of the logos. So, uh, of course, scripture uses this term logos, you know, in uh, John 1 and in various other places, and it's a reference to this principle of reason, this principle of wisdom, this principle of rationality, and of course it's a reference to Christ, the person of Christ, who is seen in uh, these texts and in some of this early patristic thought as really the um, apotheosis, the ultimate source of the wisdom and reason and rationality of the universe. And what Justin tries to show is that the reason of the early pagan philosophers, pe some of the people we looked at um, last week, like Plato, um, really is a reflection of, an imperfect reflection of, the reason and wisdom of Christ. Um, and he tries to show also that the God who is uh, revealed in the Hebrew Scriptures and revealed in Christ is really the true fount of all this wisdom, and the pagan gods are not. So, in terms of how we ought to live, in terms of how society ought to be structured, he's not rejecting anything that sort of is reasonable and makes sense, in the pagan tradition, but he wants to show how those pieces of it connect with the Christian tradition and how the uh, Christian tradition, in fact, fulfills and then supersedes those other traditions.
The next source we want to talk about briefly is Tertullian. So Tertullian, as you can see from uh, the dates of his life uh, here on the screen, overlaps a bit when he's when he's young with Justin, um, but sort of comes after Justin. He's in a, a different, somewhat different period in geographic area. Tertullian is really often kind of presented as a foil to Justin in terms of his thought, because what Tertullian said is, well, you know, no, I mean, the, the, the Christian revelation is utterly unique, and um, really, Jerusalem doesn't have anything to do with Athens. His famous quote is, what does Jerusalem have to do um, with Athens? And what he means by that is that let's get away from all these pagan sources. Let's uh, not engage so much in this project of trying to see these commonalities, and let's assert that the, um, the Christian message, the uh, Christian theology, is really something completely unique. Um, as the text indicates, one of the things that's important for Tertullian is the concept of law. And I, I, one of the themes that we're going to be drawing out, that's obviously interesting to me as a lawyer and a law professor, um, is the role of law in Christian ethics. Now, you know, I say as a lawyer and a law professor, you know, what we do in, in law school is what we call positive law. Positive law is the law that's sort of on the statute books, that's in the courts, you know, in a particular cultural setting. And that's not really what these guys are talking about when they're talking about law. They're talking about perhaps natural law. They're talking about the God's revealed law in Scripture, which, which may then find its way into various forms of positive law. But there's a big question of what does the moral law have to do with Christian theology and Christian thought and ethics and with the church and with how we live in the world? Well, you know, Justin with his emphasis on the Lagos, is going to have more of a sense of what we might call natural law today. Tertullian um, is going to have more of a sense of revealed law. And in fact, what Tertullian emphasized was that the gospel is actually a new law. And the new law of the gospel is what assists Christians in particular in, in obtaining the righteousness of God in a way that pagans cannot. So he offset. So you can see these very early on themes that we continue to deal with and that we will deal with all semester and that there's no simple answer to, which is really this uh, uh, general relation of faith and reason or revelation and reason and this general relation of what we might call um, nature, what's kind of evident from just the created world, and grace, or what requires something special from God for us to see it. And we'll see that theme um, a little in a little bit when I tie everything together. Okay, the next figure we uh, focus on here is one of the uh, Cappadocian fathers, which is uh, Basil the Great. So one of the big emphases of the, the Cappadocians was the question of wealth. And so as you can see from uh, the time in when Basil lived, we're getting into a period when um, the church is uh, no longer in the minority, and the church and people within the church are dealing with the question of acquiring wealth. The church is dealing with what to do with wealthy people, patrons of the church, uh, and with its own wealth. And uh, there was a real concern among many thinkers during during this time about how to do this. And as you can see from the text, and as you might be a little bit surprised to learn, there was a real ambivalence uh, among many of these thinkers about wealth. And as our uh, text indicates, uh, these many of these leaders at this time were very concerned about um, economic inequality, and there were some stark inequalities um, within the church at this time. I have a really good book on my shelf, and I think I listed it in the bibliography in the syllabus. If you're interested in this issue, it's by a historian named Peter Brown, and it's called Through the Eye of a Needle. 
uh, wealth, the fall of Rome, and the making of the, in the Christian uh, making of Christianity in the West. Uh, um, and so it's a really interesting book on how, as, as the Roman Empire is falling and as Christendom is kind of uh, rising from those ashes, how the early Christians are dealing with with wealth. And there was a strong sense at that time that if you were wealthy, you should be ultimately giving away all of your wealth. And and uh, many people did. Um, although, as Brown's book illustrates, they kind of did it over the course of their whole lifetime. It was almost like setting up charitable foundations or something like that. And another figure we want to um, mention in this group is Ambrose of Milan. Um, now, one of the interesting things about Ambrose's story is that he was a Roman governor, a politician, um, prior to becoming a Christian and becoming a uh, Christian bishop. So he has a you know, strong background and a strong emphasis on what makes a just social order. Uh, and one of his legacies, which um, theologically is interesting and historically is perhaps somewhat ambiguous, is the, the tying of justice, of the right ordering of the Republic, to orthodoxy, that is, to right thinking about who God is and about who Jesus is. And that raises some interesting questions. And I think, um, you know, if we, if we look scripturally in the Hebrew scriptures, we certainly see a strong emphasis on the fact that the society is only rightly ordered when it's rightly ordered under God and under God's law and recognizing who God really is. Now, by the time we get to the New Testament, there's a bit more ambiguity, perhaps, about how God's people relate to secular rulers. Um, that ambiguity is, some, to some extent, present in people like Justin Martyr and Tertullian. And as we move into the period of Christendom, um, there's now a sense that, that the secular order ought to mirror um, or, or draw from the ecclesial order. Um, and that will be something that gets wrestled with all the way up through the Reformation and into the Reformation, and then, of course, in the modern period. So our concepts of how church relates to state are going to be very different than Ambrose's concepts were. Um, and indeed, our, our, our whole notion of what the state is, um, if we're coming from a liberal democratic background, are going to be very different. And those are things that, that as Christian theologians and theological ethicists, we really need to think through and, and wrestle with and not just take for granted.